32, numbers 1 through 36. And let's go ahead and get started with this assignment. Um, I know you're not looking forward to it, and I know it's not going to be the highlight of your day, but this is a really, really, really good assignment, okay? And it's going to be a good review for you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. Here we go. Okay, question number one. In a coordinate plane, plot these points. Now, I know that's pretty simple, but we're going to plot those points, then sketch the angle, then classify the angle. Alright, so please take some good notes. Let's go ahead and draw our coordinate plane here. Our first point is 4, 6. So for point A, I went over 4, up 6. We're going to call that point A, okay? Point B is negative 1, 3. So we go over 1 to the left, and then up 3. Okay, we'll call that point B. Got it? And then C. Positive 5, negative 1. Positive 5, negative 1. Alright. Now there's my angle. Okay. Now. <clears throat> there we go. Now next, they want us to classify the angle. Now classify it means I mean, it's either going to be acute or it's going to be uh, obtuse, or it's going to be a right angle, one of those three things, okay? Now, students, what they're testing you on here is your memory as to what acute angle or right angle is. Now, if you've drawn your angle very neatly, it's obvious you have an acute angle. Now, if this line right here were moved up a little bit like this, then you would have a right angle right here, okay? Um, and of course, if the angle was moved, if this line AB was moved way out here like this, then you would have an obtuse angle, okay? But the angle we have here is an acute angle right here. It's smaller than 90, okay? So they're asking, they're making sure you remember what, uh, that you know your definitions of angles, acute, obtuse, and right. All right, number two, find the measure of angles one, two, and three. Now, here's what they're reviewing. They're reviewing in this problem two different things. Number one, anytime two lines intersect. And by the way, students, you're welcome to work ahead on this assignment. That is totally fine. Just check and make sure you're getting them right, please, okay? All right, when two lines intersect, these two angles here are called vertical angles, and these two angles here are called vertical angles. Vertical angles are always congruent. So if this angle here is 126 degrees, then angle three is also 126 degrees. So that's the first thing they're reviewing here in this question. Vertical angles are congruent. The second thing that they're reviewing in this uh, question is the fact that straight lines are called straight angles, and they always equal 180 degrees. So from here to here is 180. So this angle here with one dot right here, and this angle here with two dots right here, those two angles have to add up to 180, because I have a straight line right here with the ray coming off of it, like this, straight line with the ray coming off of it. So this angle and this angle over here have to add up to 180. So I have 126 degrees right here. So this angle right here from here to here would have to be 54 degrees, okay? Now, remember what I just taught you about vertical angles, okay? If this angle right here is 50, four degrees. Vertical angles are congruent, so angle one also has to be 54 degrees. So there we go. 54, 54, and 126 for angle three. Moving on to question number three. Question number three, the problem says this. Find the measure of each numbered angle. Okay. Well, guys, look, what they're reviewing here is this. Whenever you have perpendicular lines, they form four right angles. We actually learned a theorem or a um, uh, postulate about that. So anytime students, you have perpendicular 
perpendicular lines, you'll have four right angles like this, okay? All right, so with that in mind, that means all of these angles are right angles. So this angle here is 90, this angle here is 90, this angle here is 90, and this angle here is 90. So the measure of angles 1 and 2 are 90 degrees. Pretty simple. Okay, moving on to number 4. Now what they're reviewing in number 4 is this. And I had to go over all this with you guys now just to make sure that we're getting this, okay? They're reviewing, um, first of all, whether or not you remember the different types of angles that are formed when two lines are cut by a transversal. Anytime two lines are cut by a transversal. It doesn't matter if those two lines are parallel or not. One could look like this, one could look like this, then this line here. Remember, all these angles with one dots are called corresponding angles. Those two angles are corresponding. Those two angles are corresponding. This angle and this angle is corresponding. And this one and this one, they come in sets of two. Consecutive interior angles. This angle here and this angle here, consecutive interior. This angle here and this angle here, consecutive interior. This angle here and this angle here, consecutive exterior. This angle here and this angle here, consecutive exterior. And this angle here and this angle here, um, uh, and I said that wrong and I apologize, guys, I'm so sorry. I know my math well. These are called alternate exterior, those two. And these are called alternate exterior. These two here, not consecutive, sorry. And these two angles here are called alternate interior. And these two angles here are called alternate interior, okay? Sorry about that. And now these two angles here are called consecutive interior. And these two angles here are called consecutive interior, okay? So they're kind of seen, if you remember that, in the next, when you do have two parallel lines cut by a transversal like we have right here, you have to remember which angles are congruent, which ones are supplementary, etc. For example, I have two lines that are intersecting, all right? So that means these two angles here are vertical, okay? So if those two angles there are vertical, okay, sorry, students had to pause the video there. If these two lines are intersecting, then these two angles here are consecutive, just like back here in number two when two lines intersect consecutive angles are congruent so if this is 118 degrees here then angle three is also 118 degrees now what we learned is whenever two parallel lines are cut by a transversal corresponding angles are congruent okay corresponding angles are congruent so if angle three is 118 degrees angle four would also be 118 degrees all right, so both those angles are 118. We've learned a lot of stuff this year, guys, and it's good to review it. Moving on to number five. Okay, we have the same thing again, students. Now, I think sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it's helpful to, um, to rotate this thing, just my opinion, so that your parallel lines are running horizontally like this. Okay, so there we go. So I have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, okay? Now, notice this is 81 degrees right here. Now, do we not have a straight line right here? Yes, we do. Do we not have a ray coming off of it? Yes, we do. So this angle and this angle are supplementary. They have to add up to 180 degrees. So if this is 81 degrees here, then this has to be 99 degrees because 99 plus 81 is 180. Now, let's get back to our rules. We have two parallel lines cut by a transversal. This angle here that I'm circling and this angle here are what we call alternate interior angles. Alternate interior and they're congruent. When two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, alternate interior angles are congruent. 
sole and they're exterior because they're on the outside of the parallel lines. So alternate exterior angles are congruent. And these two angles that I've circled are alternate exterior angles. So the measure of angle seven here is 99 degrees. Guys, I hope that helps, okay? That's really, really important that we understand that math, okay? And there's the answers right there, even though it's really hard to see, okay? All right, now let's continue on. Number six. Okay, first of all, we're going to find the value of x. Now, what they're reviewing here is all three angles of the triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. So these two angles added together are 124 degrees, 70 plus 54. So if you take 124 and subtract it from 180 degrees, you're going to get 56 degrees. So this angle here, angle X, is 56 degrees. Now, they want us to classify the triangle by its angles. That's what number 7 says, okay? So, um, all three angles are acute angles. All three angles are acute. They are smaller than 90. So this is an acute triangle. All right, now write the sides of the triangle from longest to shortest. Okay, good. Now what they're reviewing here is this. They're reviewing the fact that the longest side of a triangle is across from the largest angle, and the shortest side of a triangle is the shortest side of a triangle is across from the smallest angle. So they want us to write the sides of the triangles from longest to shortest. So I'm gonna find the biggest angle and circle it. There it is, the biggest angle. Now go straight across. BC is my longest side because it's across from the biggest angle. So BC comes first. Now let's find the next biggest angle. 56 degrees, circle it, go straight across. Okay, so AC is the next biggest or longest side. And then obviously last would be the other side, which is AB, okay? And of course you could put CB, CA, or BA, it doesn't matter. All right, okay, moving on. Number nine, now in numbers nine, 10, 11, they want us to, if it's possible, show the triangles are congruent. If it is possible, state the theorem or postulate that you used. Now listen carefully, I'm gonna list off to the sides the ways that we have learned to prove that triangles are congruent. Side, side, side side angle side angle angle side angle side angle and then for a right triangle we can use hypotenuse leg okay and so here we go now um notice i have this side here congruent to this side here and this side here congruent to this side here now, that's real important that you see that students because this is this problem is packed into a lot of review first of all um we have a parallelogram now here's how i know that we learned four or five ways to prove that a quadrilateral is a parallelogram and one of the ways that we learn guys and you should know this is if both sets of opposite sides are congruent we learned that okay well is this side congruent to this side yes they're marked is this side congruent to this side yes they're marked so i have both sets of opposite sides congruent which means i have a parallelogram okay now if i have a parallelogram what do i know about parallelograms opposite angles are congruent okay so I know that opposite angles are congruent. So I have side angle side congruent to side angle side. Okay. So yes, these two triangles are congruent by side angle side. But there's also another way they're congruent if you think about it. And that is side 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 because this side's congruent to this side. This side's congruent to this side, and they both share the side here. So the, also we can say these two triangles are congruent by side, side, side. Okay, moving on to number 10. Now, we have two lines that are intersecting right here and right here. That mom. So if two lines here, students, are intersecting like this, we learned this, we talked about this just a couple minutes ago when two lines are 
intersect, their vertical angles are congruent. So this angle here is congruent to this angle here. Now look what you have, students. You have angle, angle, side, congruent to angle, angle, side. So yes, these two triangles are congruent. By what theorem? Angle, angle, side. Right there it is. All right, number 11. All right, now let's see. Um, we have a right angle here. Look what I have. First of all, students, I have a, a line here and a line here, and they're both parallel, okay? And they're cut by a transversal. Now, anytime two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, their corresponding angles are congruent. And this angle here that I'm circling, and this angle here that I'm circling right here, are corresponding angles. So because I have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, the corresponding angles are congruent. So this angle here is 90. That means this angle here is 90 also. Now look what I have in this right triangle. Let's go way back here. I told you guys, when you have a right triangle, if you have a hypotenuse and a leg of one triangle congruent to a hypotenuse leg of another triangle, the two triangles are congruent. Well, look, I have a hypotenuse here congruent to a hypotenuse here, and I have a leg here congruent to, congruent to a leg here. So I have one right triangle here and one right triangle here, and they have an hypotenuse leg congruent to an hypotenuse leg. So yes, these two triangles are congruent by hypotenuse leg. All right. Okay, number 12. Two acute angles are what? Well, first of all, I better read the directions for 12 and 13. You're going to put always, sometimes, or never. Two acute angles are always complement, always complementary. Never complementary or sometimes. Well, the answer is sometimes. Okay, and I'm going to show you why right now. If I have two acute angles and one is 90, or excuse me, one is 40 and one is 50, then they're complementary. Okay? But if I have two acute angles that would, that are 50 and 20, then those two acute angles are not complementary. Remember, complementary means they add up to 90 degrees, okay? So the answer would be sometimes. All right, number 13. The sides of a rhombus are always congruent. Guys, that's the definition of a rhombus. The definition of a rhombus is a parallelogram that has all four sides congruent. So yes, that is always true. Always. All right, number 14. A rectangle has exactly one line of symmetry. Now, let's just think about that, okay? I can draw a line here. That's a line of symmetry. I can draw a line here. That's a line of symmetry. A line of symmetry is a line that you can draw. And if you folded this shape right on that line, this part here would fall right on top of that, that part there. And that's true. Here's another line of symmetry. If you were to fold this rectangle right on this line right here, this part here would fall right on top of this part here. So, it says a rectangle has exactly one line of symmetry. I just showed you how it has two. That is never true. Never. Okay. Number 15. Two squares are always congruent. Well, that's, I mean, two squares are always, sometimes, are never congruent. Well, you know, guys, you could have a square like this and a square like this. They're not congruent. Or you could have a square like this and a square like this, and they are congruent. So, two squares are sometimes congruent. Sometimes, but not always. All right, number 16 uh, says, find the value of the variable. Okay, now, please notice what I have. This is a great review. First of all, I have a trapezoid. I would make note of that. How do I know that? Because I have a four-sided figure. One, two, three, four. And exactly one set of sides are parallel. This side here is parallel to this side here, and this side here is not parallel to this side here. So I have a trapezoid. Next, I want to notice, I want you to notice that use the midpoint. U is right in the middle of PT. How do I know that? Because this segment here is congruent to this segment here. So U has to be right in the middle. I also want to point out to you that R 
is the midpoint of QS. R is right in the middle. How do I know that? Because this segment here is congruent to this segment here. So R has to be in the middle. Now, why did I point that out to you? We learned that this segment right here that connects the midpoints of the two sides of the legs is called a mid-segment. This segment here that connects the two midpoints is called a mid-segment. And we learned that the mid-segment is um, half as big as the sum of your bases. So one base has a length of 7. The other base has a length of 13. Add those two together. And then divide by 2. And you'll get 10. Okay, so that's what we've learned so far this year about trapezoids. Or one of the things we've learned so far. Okay, all right, moving on to number 17. <coughs> ABC. ABC, so X equals 10. ABC is a rhombus. Okay, so let's solve for X, Y, and Z. Now, students, first of all, remember by definition, a rhombus is also a what? Do you remember? It is a parallelogram. That means a rhombus has all of the characteristics of a rhombus, but it also has all the characteristics of a parallelogram. So what that means is this. First of all, in a rhombus, all four sides are congruent. So 3x minus 1, this side right here, equals this side over here, and this side is 8. So 3x minus 1 equals 8. Let's solve for x. Bring the 1 over. Make it a positive 1. 1, 8 plus 1 is 9. Now divide both sides by 3. x equals 3. So there we go. Um, x is 3. Now, if we have a parallelogram, remember in parallelograms, opposite angles are congruent. So if this is 70 degrees, then y is also going to be 70 degrees. But we also know something else in a parallelogram. Consecutive angles. That means angles that are side by side are supplementary. That means they have to add up to 180. So Z would have to be 110 degrees because 110 plus 70 is 180. All right. So there we go. And there we go. All right. 3, 70, and 110. All right. Let's continue on to number 18. JKLM is a rectangle. Now, remember the definition of a rectangle is, do you remember, it is a parallelogram with four right angles. So right away I know this angle right here is 90 degrees. That's easy. <clears throat> now next, if a rectangle is a parallelogram, that means its opposite sides are congruent. So I know this side, 2x plus 5 has to equal its opposite side, which is 4x minus 5. All right, so let's bring your 4x over, and when you bring it over, it becomes a negative 4x. Cross that off. Now bring your positive 5 over, and it becomes a negative 5. Cross this off. So we're left with 2 minus 4, negative 2x. Negative 5, negative 5, negative 10. Divide both sides by negative 2. A negative 10 divided by a negative 2 is 5. So we know that y is 90 degrees and x equals 5. Okay, so there we go. All right, moving on to numbers 19, 20, and 21. All right, which theorem or postulate could you use to show that triangle ABC is similar? to triangle ADE, all right? Well, let's take a look at this, okay? Um, ABC, ADE, I think it's best to split the two triangles up. So I've got a little triangle here. I'm going to call that triangle A, B, C. Now I've got my big triangle right here, all right? This big triangle here. This is a length of 4. Um, 
circle. No, I'm sorry, Stu, that's not correct. Side angle side. And then another way we learned. Um, well, this will work for now. So, students, we have noticed this. We have a parallel line here and a parallel line here cut by a transversal. Got it? Well, guys, this angle here that I'm marking with a dot and this angle here with a dot are corresponding angles. So anytime we have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, the corresponding angles are congruent. So I know that this angle right here is congruent to this angle here. Okay, this angle here, this angle here, but hold it. Don't both triangles share this angle right here? Sure they do. So I know this angle here is congruent to this angle here. So which theorem or postulate would you use to show the two triangles are, are similar? The angle-angle postulate. Okay, that's what I would use, angle-angle. Now, number 20, complete the proportion. So we have DB. Right here, DB over DA. Got it? So here it is, DB over DA. So this little one here, DB over the whole side DA equals, well, then you're going to want to put the little side here, CE over AE. Let's go over that again, okay? Look, they're, what they're doing is they're taking this little segment here. This little segment here, BD, and they're putting it over the whole segment, AD, the whole segment. So we're going to do the same thing. Take this little segment here, the bottom little segment, and put it over this little thing here. So you would have BD over AD equals, and then CE over AE. So the top right here should be CE or EC. Then it says find the value of X. Okay, no problem. We can do it very quickly. Um, for DB right here, see this DB right here? What is DB? It's X. So I'm going to put X. X over what? DA. DA. Got it. Well, DA would be X plus 2. All right. Now, right up here is CE. Well, students, if the whole line is 10, and this much from here to here is 4, then CE has to be 6. So CE is 6, CE over EA, EA is the whole line, which is 10. So now let's cross multiply and divide, let's go over this again. It says DB, DB is X, then it says DA, DA is this whole line, so X plus 2. Then it says EC, which is 6, because the whole line is 10, 10 minus 4 is 6, over EA, which is 10, the whole thing. So cross multiply, 10 times X is 10X. X plus 2 times 6 would be 6X plus 12. 6 times X, 6 times 2. Bring your 6X over and make it a negative 6X. And you're left with 4X equals 12. 4X equals 12. Now divide both sides by 4, and X equals 3. X equals 3. All right. So there we go. Moving on to number 22, and 23, and 24. Okay, let's classify the polygon, the polygon by its sides. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It has five sides, so we call that a pentagon, okay? Pentagon. All right, number 23. Is the, con is the polygon convex or concave? Explain. Well, guys, a concave polygon is a polygon that has an indentation like that, okay? And you can recognize them because if, if there's anywhere in the polygon, you can draw a line that intersects more than two sides that is convex. Over here, there's no indentations, okay? And plus, there's nowhere you can draw a line through this polygon so that it hits more than two sides. Nowhere. That will not happen. So this is a convex polygon. All right. Now, next. Um, what is the sum of the measures?
measures of the interior angles of the polygon. Well, um, uh, let's find out, okay? And students, the way we're going to find out is, we remember, we remember this formula here, anytime you have a convex polygon, you can find the sum of the measures of the interior angles by using this formula here. Of course, n is the number of sides, so we have five sides, so we have 180, 5 minus 2, so 180 times 3, which is 540 degrees. So there we go. That is the sum of the measures of the interior angles, 540. So if you added up this angle plus this angle plus this angle plus this angle plus this angle, you would get 540. Now we don't know how much each angle is, but we know there's sums 540. Now, what is the sum of the exterior angles? Students, that never changes. Please don't forget that. The sum, if I extended this side here, extended this side here, extend to this side here, this side here, this side here, and I have the, this angle here, this angle here, this angle here, this angle here, this angle here. If you add up all of those exterior angles, they will always equal 360. Always. There's no formula to use. There's nothing to know. It's just always 360. Okay. So there we go. 540 and 360. All right. Numbers 25 and 26. What is the measure of an interior angle of one of the regular octagonal tiles? Okay. Well, now listen, students. First of all, if we have an octagon, that's eight sides. Got it. So they're asking us here the measure of one of the interior angles. So let's first of all find what all eight angles add up to. And you say, Mr. Earhart, how do you know there's eight angles? Well, guys, if there's five sides, there's five angles. If there's eight sides, there's eight angles. So I have a regular octagon, okay? That's eight sides. So I use my formula, 180 times n minus 2. And where the n is, I put an 8 right here. 8 minus 2 is 6, so 180 times 6, and we get 1,080. So all 8 angles added together equals 1,080. Now, because it's a regular octagon, that means all 8 angles are what? congruent. So I can take 1,080 and divide it by 8 to find the measure of one angle, and you will get 135 degrees. 8 goes into 1,080, 135 degrees. All right, so there we go. Now, what type of shape are the yellow? What type of shape are the yellow figures? Okay, well, if these green shapes are octagons, that means this side here is the same as this side here. So I, that means I have, here's my yellow shape right here. I know for sure that this side here is congruent to this side here. I know that I have 90 degrees, I have tiles, and they're, they're, uh, they're right angles. So I know then that I have a square. All four sides have to be congruent. Okay, so the yellow shape is a square. All right, 27, um, find the area of the polygon. Okay, I have a square, and the way that you find the area of a square is to take the side times the side. So 14 times 14 equals 196, okay, square meters. All right, number 28, let's find the area of a triangle. Well, the formula for area of a triangle is 1 half times the base times the height. Now remember the base and the height always have to form a right, well let me put it this way, the height has to be a line that forms a right angle with the base. Okay, so notice this side here forms a right angle with this side here. So my base is 8 and my height is 17. So I'm going to take 1 half times 8 times 17 and we're going to get 60. 8, 68 square feet, 1 half times 8 times 7, 
All right, number 29. Okay, this is a, a parallelogram. How do you find the area of a parallelogram? Well, it's the base times the height. So my base is 14. My height is 8. <coughs> so 14 times 8 would be 112 square centimeters. 112 square centimeters. All right, now number 30 is a trapezoid. So how do you find the area of a trapezoid? Well, it's 1 half times the height times the base plus the base. Okay. So here's my bases. They are the parallel sides. And here's my height right here. It's 4. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to add my bases together. My base plus my base is 13. 4 plus 9. Now, I'm going to put into, uh, for H, I'm going to put in my height, which is 4. So 1 half times 4 times 13. If you take 1 half times 4, that's 2. And 2 times 13 is 26 square inches. Okay, 26 square inches. All right, let's move on now to numbers 31 through 34. We're going to find the surface area and volume of the solid. If necessary, we're going to round to the nearest whole number. Okay, for students, I do not. let's start with the surface area. So I have a top and a bottom, a right and a left, and a front and a back. Okay, so we're going to find the area of each one of these. Now the top of my rectangular prism is obviously the same as the bottom. Now both of these are rectangles. In order to find the area of a rectangle, it's length times the width. So 4 times 10. So the area of the top and the bottom is going to be 40 and 40. Okay, now let's find next the area of the right side. Now the right side is right here. And it's obviously going to be the same shape as the left side over here. Okay. So, in order to find this right side, I have length times width, 8 times 10. So the area of the right side is 80. The area of the left side is 80. All right. Now I have the front and the back. All right. Now, notice I have a length or a width of 4 right here, but I don't know the length right here, but I actually do. It's going to be the same as this length back here, which is 8, so this will be 8 also. So the area of my front, 4 times 8 is 32 and 32. Okay, let's quickly add these up. We get 4, 24, 27, 30. So the, um, the surface area will be 304 meters squared. Alright, so we found the area of each side, all six of them, and added them up. Now, to find the um, volume of this, remember it's area of base, so capital B, times the height. So the base that it's sitting on is 4 times 10. Okay, that's the area of that base. So the, the base is 40, 4 times 10, that's the area. So the area of the base is 40 times the height. The height goes up 8. So 40 times 8 would give you 320 cubic meters because we're dealing with volume. Okay, so the surface area equals 304 square meters. The volume is 320 cubic meters. All right, moving on now to number 32. We're going to find the surface area and the um, volume of a triangular pyramid. So students, if we're going to find the um, volume and the surface area of this pyramid, then we need a couple formulas, okay? And this is where you guys really need to brush up on these and make sure you're ready for these when you take the uh, test over chapter 9 coming up, okay? So, um, let me go ahead and put those up here for you. There we go. 
um, the formula for the surface area is this right here, and the formula for the volume is this right here. Now let's start off first of all with the uh, surface area. Okay, let's get this out of the way. Now the surface area is capital P. That's area of base plus P one half. P is the perimeter of the base. L is the slant height. Okay, L is the slant height, and so. I'm not sure why I covered this up, but anyways, there we go. So, let's fill in what we know, okay? The surface area equals area of base. Well, my base is a square, okay? So, the area of the base is 10 times 10. It's 100. So, the area of the base is 100 plus 1 half. Now, capital P is the perimeter of the base. That means the distance around the base. So, I have... 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. So the perimeter around the entire base is 40. Now, little l stands for slant height. That's if you were standing up here on top of the pyramid, okay? And you've got your friend down here, and he wants to climb up the side of the pyramid, and you throw a rope down to him right here, okay? And he grabs it and crawls up the side of the pyramid, okay? Um, that that's your slant height, okay? So what you have to do is this. You have to find the slant height, and we can do that pretty easily. Look, we know the height straight down is 12. They give that to us. Now, put a point here, go straight over to the midpoint here, and then draw this slant height. Guys, look, you have a right triangle. You have a right triangle like this. So we're going to call our slant height x. We know the height going up is 12. And we know this right here. Because we know this is right in the middle. And it goes from here all the way over. That means it's from here over. Well, that's half of 10. That's 5. So this is 5. So now using Pythagorean's theorem, we have 12 squared plus 5 squared equals hypotenuse squared. So 144 plus 25 equals x squared. That's 169 equals x squared. And the square root of 169 is 13. Okay, so now we know that the slant height is uh, 13. X right here is 13. So my slant height is 13. So for L, I'll put 13. So now let's see what I have. I have 100 plus 1 half times 40 is 20. 20 times 13 is 260. Add those two together, and you get 360 square feet. So that's the surface area right here. Okay. Now, next let's find the volume of this pyramid. Well, the volume is pretty simple. It's one-third times the area of the base. We already found the area of the base is 100 times the height, straight up height, not the slant height, the height, which is 12. So if you take one-third times 100 times 12, you will get 400 cubic feet. Okay, 400 cubic feet. All right, number 33. They want us to find the surface area and the volume of a cylinder. Now, students, like the last time I told you, we did our formulas, okay? So here they are. Now, we have the formula for volume and the formula for surface area, okay? So here we go. Let's start off with the surface area first. 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r. So 2 times 3 times radius squared. Well, here's the radius right here. 3. So 3 squared. Plus 2 times pi 3.14 times the radius, which is 3. Okay. So let me get on my calculator here. I know that 3 squared right here is 9. So this whole thing here becomes 9. 3 times 3 is 9. So 2 times 3.14 times 9 is going to give me 56.52 plus and then 2 times 3.14 times 3 is 18.84 add those two together and you get 75.36 alright uh, 
75. Actually, I don't think that's right. Hold on one second. Okay, students, I did leave off one letter right here, sorry, which is the height, okay? So, um, really, there should be, um, let me grab this and slide it over. And here I was getting onto you guys for not knowing the formulas, and now I don't know them myself. The H right here, and the height is 9, so there really should be a 9 right here, okay? So instead of having 18.84, you're going to have 169. Point fifty six. Now add to that fifty six point fifty two, and you get two hundred and twenty six point zero eight. And we're supposed to round to the nearest whole number, so two hundred and twenty six square because it's surface area square centimeters. Okay, two hundred and twenty six. Okay. Now let's go ahead and find the volume. All right, the volume, and the volume of course is area of base times the height. Now, our base is a circle, correct? So how do you find the area of a circle? Pi r squared. So in order to find the area of the base, we're going to do pi r squared. And then, of course, the height is 9. All right. So here we go. We have 3.14 times radius squared. And all of that times 9. Well, 3 squared is 9. So now I have 3.14 times 9, and then times 9. So here we go. 3.14 times 9 times 9 gives us 254.34. Round that to the nearest whole number, 254 cubic, because it's volume, cubic centimeters, or centimeters cubed. Now, let's go over this again. Area of base. In this case, your base was a circle. How do you find the area of a circle? Pi r squared. What's your height? 9. Pi is 3.14. Your radius is 3. And then the rest is calculator work. All right. Okay, number 34. We're going to find the surface area and the volume of a cone. Okay, students, first of all, we'll need our two formulas. So our two formulas are right here, okay? Let's start off with the surface area. Now, the surface area equals capital B. That's area of base. Now, your area of base, your base is a circle, okay? So your diameter all the way across is 24, which means your radius halfway across, kind of 24 and a half, will be 12. So your radius is 12. Now, let's find the area of your base. Your base is a circle. And, of course, the area of a circle is pi r squared plus pi r l. Now, we do know the slant height is 20. So that's good. And we know the radius is 12. So for pi right here, I'm going to put 3.14 times the radius, which is 12, times the slant height, which is 20. Now, over here, I have pi r squared. So 3.14 times 12 squared. So I'm breaking out my calculator real quick. I'm going to take 12 times 12. That's going to give me 144. And then multiply that times 3.14. And I'm going to get 452.16. Plus, now we have 3.14 times 12 times 20. And that will give you 753. Point six. Okay, now let's add those two numbers together quickly, and we're going to get 1,205.76, and of course we're rounding to the nearest whole number, so 1,206. Let's slide this over and take a look at it. Yeah, there it is, 1,206 centimeters squared. Okay, now let's go ahead and find the uh, volume of this cone, all right? So the formula says one-third times the area of the base times the height. Well, let's go back. I shouldn't have got rid of all that. We already know the area of the base right here. Remember, capital B is this. And when I plugged all those numbers in, I got this. So let's not forget that, okay? The area of the base, we already found that. Let's not waste our 
time and do it again. 452.16, okay? That's the area of the base. Now, so I have one third times 452.16 times the height. Now, students, we don't know the height. You might say, yes, we do. It's 20. No, that's the slant height. We've got to find the height that goes right down through the middle of this cone. So what I see is a right triangle right here, okay? So I know my leg is 12, my hypotenuse is 20, so I'm missing a leg. That's the height, I'm missing that. So I have leg squared plus leg squared. Equals hypotenuse squared, all right? So actually it'd be 12 squared, not 24 squared, because from here to here is 12. So x squared plus 12 squared equals 20 squared, all right? So now I have x squared plus 144 equals 400. Now bring the 144 over and make it negative. 400 minus 144 is going to give you 256, okay? Now, if you take the square root of 256, you're going to get 16. Take the square root of both sides, 16. So the height is 16. The height is 16. So here we go. If you take one third times 452.16 times 16, you will get 2,000. 411.52, and if you run that to the nearest whole number, you'll get 2,412 cubic centimeters. I'm not sure why they have a 13, I'm getting a 12, but it's close enough either way. All right, numbers 35 and 36, and we're finally finished. Find the surface area and the volume of the sphere. All right, so here we go. Obviously, students, the first two things that we'll need are the formulas. So there's our formulas, okay? Now, let's go ahead and find the surface area of the sphere. Here's the formula. It's simply 4 times 3.14 times the radius squared. Now, the radius is 32. I mean, the diameter is 32. So cut that in half, and you'll get the radius 16 squared. So really, students, this is a calculator problem, okay? If you take 16 squared, you're going to get 256, then times 3.14 times 4, and you're going to get 3,215.36. And of course, if you run that to the nearest whole number, you get 3,215. Alright, I'm not sure. I think the reason they're getting a little bigger numbers is they're not using 303.14. They're using the pi button on the calculator, which is fine. I would give credit for either one of those answers. That's totally fine, okay? So there's the surface area of the sphere. Now let's find the volume, okay? So 4 thirds times 3.14 times radius cubed, so 16 to the third power. Alright, so 16 to the third power is 4096 times 3.14 times 4 thirds. And that will give you 17,148.58. So we're just going to make this a 9. We're going to round to the nearest whole number. Alright, let's see how close we were to their answer. Um, I wonder what I did wrong there. Let's see, guys. Um, let me try this again real quick. Oh, my bad, students. I did nothing wrong at all. It says what is half of the volume of the sphere. So divide this by 2, and you'll get 8, 5, 7, 4, or 5, like that, which is close enough to what they're getting because we didn't use the pi button on the calculator. So there we go. So I did not see it said it wanted half the volume, not all of the volume. So there we go. And that would be cubic inches. Okay. Um, all right. Guys, I hope that this uh, video
has been a help to you guys. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to call or email.